I'm Nikki Herta, and this is Bright, Stories of Hope and Innovation in Michigan Classrooms, a podcast where we celebrate our state's educators and explore the future of learning. Let's dive in. During this past year, one of the biggest challenges educators reported was keeping students engaged and motivated while learning online during the pandemic. This very real issue has left some questioning the validity of online learning itself. But experts like Dr. Chris Harrington say this has less to do with the intrinsic merits of virtual learning and more to do with a combination of implementation and circumstance. Chris was a teacher for 11 years and a central office administrator for 15. After this, he began work as a consultant, helping schools across the nation design innovative learning models and as a researcher in a doctoral education program. Today, Chris serves as the director of the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, where he leads a team of researchers who study the most effective practices for online and blended learning. This year, Chris's research team released a landmark study on key strategies for engaging students in virtual learning environments. In this study, they surveyed a large sample size of over 1,800 virtual educators from 17 state virtual programs who are part of the Nationwide Virtual Learning Leadership Alliance, or VLLA. The quantitative and qualitative data gathered in this survey distills key practices from teachers and administrators who live, breathe, and teach in fully virtual environments on a daily basis. It offers a roadmap for educators looking to gain familiarity with key strategies for keeping students motivated in the online classroom. Chris wants people to know that there's a big difference between the form of online learning that many students and teachers experienced during the pandemic and the kind offered at seasoned virtual programs such as the state schools surveyed in this report. During this episode, Chris and I dive deeper into his reflections on pandemic teaching common misconceptions about online learning, and the implications of his team's study. This past year, you know, if you, as you've already acknowledged, has been a challenging one for, a lot, for most educators and students. Um, some students may have found that they thrived in online learning, but many struggled. And um, the topic of student engagement has been um, prevalent in the education community. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe why so many people have been struggling with student engagement in online learning this past year and what you think is going on there. Yeah, um, it's a, I think at the core of it is we, our educational models in most schools and districts, not only in Michigan, but across the country, were very, um, a lot of more very teacher centric and rely on the physical face-to-face environment. So when we were forced and pushed into emergency remote teaching and learning back in spring of 2020, and of course, as we know, this continued on throughout the current 2021 school year, we, we have students who don't necessarily know how to thrive in this environment. Yeah, we can say they're digital natives and, you know, they understand technology, but they've, they've spent their educational career up to this point mostly in a physical face-to-face environment. So when you put them in a new environment, that's a whole different way of looking at things and different skills that you have to tap into. And teachers are no different, right? It's kind of like um, if you uh, if you walk around a pool all day um, or, or, or for many years in your life, but you never actually go in and swim, and then all of a sudden somebody pushes you in the deep end, there's going to be a lot of flailing and um, just trying to survive here. And I think that's a uh, it's kind of what we're seeing here in education in this emergency remote teaching and learning environment. Do you worry at all as a result um, of what you just described that some people will walk away, educators and students and families alike, with kind of misconceptions about what online learning is and can, could be? Yeah, I totally do. <laughs> um, and, and, and I hear it. I hear it from administrators. I hear it from teachers. I hear it from kids and I hear it from parents. The the whole idea that, oh, my gosh, this online learning doesn't work. I mean, we see it in the news, too, don't we? And, you know, it's I think what we've been experiencing to a large extent with this, what often is called pandemic teaching and learning, 
a lot of that doesn't work um, because we're we're it's, we're, tr- we're we don't have the right tools and the right training to be able to do it well, and and I think people are getting a taste of that and and they're they're thinking that oh this is what online learning is about and it's really not the two are not synonymous uh, this pandemic teaching and learning and virtual learning they're not synonymous and I and I think there are some families and some schools that are just thinking, there is no way online learning is going to be a part of my life. When we know, in fact, that online learning does work, uh, we have scores and scores, countless numbers of, of instances where, where students and teachers and even families are thriving because of online learning. But again, that's not what is front and center right now, because what we're really experiencing is the pandemic teaching and learning. If you had to describe what those misconceptions are, how would you describe that? Like, what do they think it is that it isn't? So I think what they see is um, we have some pieces of digital content. This is, this is what the this is what the kids in the family see in a in a vert in a you know emergency or in a pandemic learning environment. They see pieces of content. That are they are there for students to consume. Um, there are some quizzes and assessments that are done in a through you know like some some online forms, uh, maybe some handouts that you scan and and send back. And there's um, there's not a lot of community building that goes on within a school, and it's very isolating. And we, we, we are seeing a lot of that because teachers are trying to have been trying to apply the skill sets that they know work in a face-to-face environment and trying to move that into the online environment. And it's like a square peg in a round hole. It's not, it's not a great fit. Can you jam it in there? Yeah, but, but things aren't going to fit right. And, um, and I think that's where, where people see this happening. And um, as a result, we have this cognitive load for kids and also for teachers where we're trying to figure this out at the same time when we're trying to learn new content and skills. And it just becomes very overwhelming for a lot of folks and it becomes very tiring. So, I mean, and we know folks are tired, teachers, administrators, families, very, very tired. And to compound that, what we see here are you have families who during the school closures and work and office place closures, we have everybody in the, the same household trying to be in a learning environment, calling it a learning environment when people are battling over Wi-Fi bandwidth or even devices, um, find, trying to find quiet time to actually do some work, you know, and, and it's just this extra layer of stress that is absolutely not, in many cases, the best kind of learning environment. So we have a lot of things stacked against us here. And I think this is this is what people are seeing and feeling and experiencing. And it just kind of skews their, or, or it helps them form an opinion, um, even though it's not what an, of an effective virtual learning environment should be. What would you like people to know about online learning? Like, you know, if you just had to kind of encapsulate, you know, I know on the spot and briefly, but... Uh, what your what it can be and what the power and promise is of it when done right. What would you tell somebody who is kind of skeptical? You know, I'm going to go back to um, the first time I ever taught an online course, and um, I, I taught the course, and I thought I was really good at it, and I actually really wasn't until I received some formal training, and then I learned how to actually structure communications and feedback and how to be very intentional. And probably one of the critical things is how to actually connect with students. So online learning can be a a, a format where students can take control of their own learning and they can move forward at their own pace. And for some kids, they can just fly through and demonstrate their mastery of content and skills and just move on. And they're not held back, right? They're not throttled. And then there are some students who can spend more time with the the digital content and exercises and and practice activities 
as much as they need because the content's available 24 seven. So kids can really engage with, with the content in their curriculum to the degree that they need. And what teachers can be, they can actually then become the architects of student learning experience experiences, where if we have digital content that can deliver content for, for students, teachers can then play what I believe to be the more critical role is not the dispenser of, of content and knowledge, but it's developing the relationships and putting kids in the right position and structuring experiences based on what kids, what individual kids truly need. And by freeing kids or teachers up to be able to do that kind of a thing, that can be an amazing experience. And we see across the country that we're trying to personalize education for kids. That's what online learning can do. Okay. But online learning is not just sticking, sticking a student behind a computer and expect the computer to do the work. It does not. The best digital content, the best devices you have, you can have amazing bandwidth, Wi-Fi and, and bandwidth. That's not what's going to help kids learn. It's the teachers. So I think online learning can be a fantastic thing if we rethink what we do as teachers and the role that we play and the support that administrators give to those teachers to empower them to be able to do that. I think it can be phenomenal. And I think, honestly, it's what we're trying to do around the area of personalization. Um, we've just hit a pretty big speed bump right here with, uh, with the pandemic creating a lot of this confusion and, and myths, to be quite honest with you. In the study by Chris and his team, key strategies for engaging students in virtual learning environments they surveyed over 1,800 virtual educators from around the nation on their top strategies for keeping students engaged in the online classroom. You can read the full report at michiganvirtual.org research, but here's a glimpse at what they found. To start, there were several strategies reported as most effective by virtual educators, including using multiple forms of content, such as text-based articles, video, audio, etc., connecting one-on-one -on -one with students by telephone or video conference, making yourself available to students through virtual office hours, and posting motivational or relational announcements in class. Many of these activities share a common thread of building strong relationships with students and humanizing the online teacher. The report also listed some strategies as more advanced which tended to be used more frequently by the most experienced of the online teachers surveyed. These more advanced strategies included having students collaborate or work together on projects or activities, including interactive elements such as polls, quizzes, or games, including discussion forums, journal entries, or reflections, and providing frequent opportunities for formative assessments. Part of the reason these activities were considered more advanced, Chris explains, is they require synchronous instructional time in which small or large groups of students are all online at the same time. Synchronous instruction is the default for most face-to-face -face classrooms around the country. However, many of the state virtual programs in this survey rely heavily on a mostly asynchronous model in which students get online at different times and can move at their own pace through the online course. In fact, out of all the educators surveyed, 75% reported that they taught primarily in an asynchronous virtual environment, and only 3% reported teaching primarily synchronously online. In the next part of our discussion, Chris and I take a deeper look at the findings of this study and explore the balance between synchronous and asynchronous instruction in online learning. That was really nice context, right, for us to set about like why the study matters and the importance of it. Um, but I'd like to dig in a little bit to the findings of the study. Um, so to start out, um, what were the most surprising results of the study to you? Things that you weren't expecting. Um, and I've been in this. I've been in this field for a while now, um, and I've I've done everything from um, teaching to working with teachers, working with administrators, designing building programs for schools, online programs. That is, um, 
And, and I've seen a lot of things. And, and honestly, I don't know if I'm necessarily surprised by anything in the findings, but I will tell you that there is something that really impressed me. And, and I think it supports something that I said earlier. The degree to which the teachers who were surveyed shared how they develop relationships and the strategies that they use. Nikki, I'm telling you, hundreds of pages of thoughts and ideas and quotes from teachers on how they engage students and how relationships play a role in that. And seeing in their own words, reading what it is that they do and the links they go to, some really great creative ideas. Um, and, and there's a lot of quotes in the actual report um, that we have published on the Michigan Virtual website. But there is so much there. I just kept reading. I'm just like, you know, it's one of those, it's, you just feel good after just combing through that data. Who can say that, right? Comb through all that data and you just feel good. But when you hear that kind of a thing or you read that kind of a thing, it's like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is totally different than a lot of what we were experiencing in the pandemic teaching, right? And it's like, that totally impressed me. Um, I knew it was there. I knew it's an important part, but um, but to actually see it and, and read these examples from teachers, yeah, I, I strongly encourage anyone to go and, and read some of those in that report. Uh, it will make you feel good. Some of the strategies that, you, that were labeled as advanced were having students collaborate or work together on projects or activities, including interactive activities such as polls, quizzes, or games, um, including activities and courses such as discussion forums, journal entries, and reflections, and providing frequent opportunities for formative assessments. Um, so what is it about these strategies that makes them more advanced? Um, why are they harder to pull off in the online environment? And how have you seen them done well? So what we see here is uh, a lot of online programs rely on asynchronous instruction. The, the, the those strategies that that you were that we were just talking about that might be a little bit more difficult, those are more of synchronous strategies. To be able to take an asynchronous course and add synchronous components, create uh, takes a little bit more skill and a little bit more expertise. And it could be around software programs that you might need to use for like Zoom or you know, Google Hangout or Google Meet, um, you know, any kind of video conferencing software. Um, things like interactive polls, you might use some other third-party products or, or resources that enable that. And we think about all the different apps you can use with kids in a, you know, um, on tablet computers um, or even um, their, their smartphones. So these are, it, it's just more ingredients in, in the whole recipe, right, for the learning environment. And those things take time. And the teachers that were surveyed here, not all of them were full-time. In fact, the vast majority were part-time teachers. So they're also teaching elsewhere. Um, and, more, and, and oftentimes it's in a traditional face-to-face -face school environment. So they have those skill sets there, but to be able to take those interactive strategies and, and move them, or those synchronous strategies, and move them into a virtual environment it looks and feels very different. Um, the rationale behind it is 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 the same. Um, the the impact and benefit you can get is the same. It's very valuable, but to actually pull that off and grow into that does take some time. And anyone who anyone who's taught in a face to face environment and then moved into a virtual environment will tell you it feels like being a first year teacher again. No matter how much experience you have, it's a whole different world. And you have to look at things differently and operate differently. But you can still have the same impact with kids, um, positive impact with kids. But it does take some time. So not only to do that, but then to get to these more advanced skills, it just takes more time. That's all. Do you have any advice that you would give teachers uh you know, who are maybe ready to take that leap to some of those more advanced strategies, anything that you've seen or would suggest? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I've seen in working with schools during the, um, the spring of 2020, right after the emergency school closures, all these providers of digital resources were offering all of these items, all their services for free to help schools. 
And what happened was teachers, it was like getting a drink from a fire hose. There's just no way you can handle all that. So there was too much. And teachers trying to do too many things in a new environment, I'll go back to that metaphor of jumping in the deep end of the pool. Imagine someone telling you to do the breast stroke, do you know all the different strokes and all these different ways to swim all at the same time. <laughs> that's gonna, it's not going to be effective. When we see teachers do that, when they're making a shift like this, if they try to do too many things at once, they tend to become ineffective. My advice would be talk to your colleagues, people who are doing using one of these strategies here very well and focus on that. Have them teach you how to do it and get good at it. And when you're ready to add another tool to your toolbox, go ahead and, and add another one, okay? But I will say the thing that I would recommend that folks really focus on is how do you connect with kids? What, what's going to develop some of those relationships and give kids feedback? That's that's where the real gold is. And that's where we've seen students really start to thrive when they don't feel isolated and they have that connection with the teacher. A lot of schools, from what I've heard, and I'm curious if this is true from your experience um, and talking to schools around the country, really, um, a lot of schools, teachers were also acting as instructional designers too, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. And so that has to be an added challenge, right? And um, were many schools from your experience doing synchronous learning or were there a lot that actually did dip into asynchronous learning? Moving into the 2021 school year, there were, a, I know there are a lot of schools who were doing fully virtual learning um, where, where just this physical school building was closed and in a lot of cases, there weren't there there wasn't content prepared for students to be able to work in a asynchronous way. Um, there were a lot of schools, however, who would um, operate in a flexible learning model, and that would mean you can come to school two days a week. So maybe you know at a high school level, maybe ninth and tenth graders came on Monday and Thursday of every week and juniors and seniors came on Tuesdays and Fridays, and Wednesday was a deep cleaning day, for example, or a day where teachers could reconnect with students to give remediation, maybe have some of their own professional development. So what ended up happening is you would have kids who were in a fully virtual environment part of the time, part of the week, with only pieces of content that they could work within, and teachers were creating that. And teachers were, car were, were craving time to be able to create that. The whole aspect of developing relationships and focusing on communication and, and making connections with kids and their families often took a back seat to the creation of content. And that was a real challenge. And when you think about like a, like a Michigan Virtual, for example, we have teachers and we have an instructional design team. There's a reason for that. You know, they they... They're very different skill sets, but they work interdependently. Um, and they both require um, the attention, uh, dedicated attention to be able to do that. When you try to do both, it becomes very difficult. And that could be something that we see moving into the future as well. If you were talking to schools who went through, you know, pandemic learning conditions or pandemic teaching, as you called it, um, is there any sort of like generalizable golden rule for, you know, when synchronous is appropriate and when asynchronous is appropriate. Um, you know, I wouldn't ask you to speak for everybody, but just in your opinion, I guess, from what you've seen and what you've seen in the research and in working with schools. Sure. Yeah, I, I can tell you what I've seen and where I see synchronous instruction really um, being not only beneficial, but being necessary. Um, and, I, and I happen to agree with, with why, I, why it comes about. When you can create an environment where kids are learning asynchronously and they can own their education and you can ensure that they're learning, let them go. Like, like as adults, we don't want to get in their way. 
right? But we have to be very mindful of their progress and how they're how they're doing, where they might be struggling. And where we see a need for intervention, we can then shift to some synchronous formats or some synchronous strategies, um, connecting with, with kids to provide remediation. Um, one of the things that really um, rose to the top was small group instruction, where you could have a class of 25 virtual students, but you might have four or five that are really struggling in this one area. Pull them aside, virtually, of course, pull them aside into a small group, maybe you can do a little direct instruction, um, provide a little remediation. But but on the other end too, there might be some students who they're just knocking it out of the park, right? And then they're 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 thriving, and it just seems like oh wow, they're 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 they could use a little bit of enrichment here, and maybe we can take them a little bit further. But you don't really know these things unless you're paying attention to the kids, right? And this is where the relationship piece comes in, and I'm not suggesting that synchronous interactions occur only when we see a concern. One of the things that came through this study was the whole process of developing relationships was about regular communication. And the way you give feedback to students, whether it's asynchronously or synchronously, the feedback, when you make it personalized, you start developing those relationships. And that's how you get to know the kids, right? So I think, um, is there a rule of thumb? I don't know, but, but, but synchronous is a great way to address problems, but it's also a great way to develop relationships. So uh, I myself, I'm a fan of synchronous aspects in a, in a course in some way, shape or form. It's not just with the synchronous with the, with the students, it's with the families too, because you know, there's the partnership, the student, the school, the family. What about collaboration? That's something I was thinking about, um, you know, looking through the data and just talking to you right now. Yeah, and, and I, I realize this might fall outside the scope of this study, but I, I do have opinions um, about some of this. Um, I, I really think that there needs to be elements of socialization and students being able to work with each other. Um, I, I, I think it's a little more difficult to do in a virtual environment. Um, having taught that, taught virtual courses and designed virtual environments, but also being a student in virtual environment, collaboration can be kind of tricky. And if you're an asynchronous course, but you're, as you're expecting students to collaborate, they're pretty much gonna be working on their own, right? And the responsibility becomes up to them. In a synchronous environment, which is you know that, that collaboration piece between students um, showed up as being more prevalent in a synchronous course than than in a, an asynchronous course, um, you have more opportunities to do that because the nature of your course is there are times when we all connect in real time. And in a video conference, on a video conference platform, you can send students off into breakout rooms to collaborate. So it's already there, it's structured, it's part of the expectation, it may come a little bit more naturally. Looking at the results of the study, did you see any areas for growth for, you know, virtual learning, you know, we, we talked a lot about the things that you can learn, we have learned that are really effective. Um, but did you see any areas that you really wanted to dig into more and see more growth in virtual learning? You know, one place I think we can always grow, um, and it's not necessarily, I mean, I, I could feel pieces or parts of this through the study and through some of the comments, but even through my own experiences in working with schools and helping them structure their, their virtual learning programs, I don't think we can spend enough time with professional development and helping teachers develop the strategies to connect with kids and the families. And we, we've learned through the pandemic that there were a lot of students who kind of just fell off the radar. They just they disengaged, you could not reach them. No matter what efforts the schools um, made, they were just off the grid, so to speak. And, and they, were, they were hard to, to communicate with and to engage. And I think where we see some schools that had a lot of success with that and didn't have a lot of students just disappearing were those schools that already had structures in place where there were strong relationships between the adults and the kids. And I think that is something that no matter how hard an online course can be for a student or for a family, 
the relationships, I think will carry through. As you look to the future of learning, how do you believe the pandemic will transform how learning happens in schools across our country? I think I can say with great confidence that things just won't be the same as they were. I think the natural tendency of human beings is to fall back to what was comfortable. Um, and, and then we keep hearing this, uh, when things return to normal, to the way they used to be, I don't know if that's going to be the case for education. I think some school systems will try because that's kind of like human nature to default back to that. But I think we've seen a lot of successes during the pandemic. And, and I know we talked a lot about challenges and struggles, but there are some families and kids who really thrived because of this and because the learning options were different. Sadly, in a lot of cases, it was because schools were forced to do it. So I think the pandemic can be a little bit of a disruptor here and it kind of blew some things up. And when the pieces come falling back down, I don't necessarily think they're all gonna fit back together the way they used to, right? And I think what we're seeing now is there are, I'm working with school leaders now, superintendents, who are talking about what's next year's learning model going to look like? Because there is a demand for online learning or flexible learning models where kids are coming part-time. They're learning part virtually, part face-to-face. So I think things are, are changing here. Another thing happened during the pandemic that's worth noting, kids developed different skills. Um, whether it was painful or not, that, that, that depends on, on the student and some of their situations. But regardless, new skills were learned and the same holds true for the teachers. We've also seen some inequities in access to technology being addressed. So some of these things that we always said were important, we need to use technology more. You know, there's a lot of promises technology can bring to us. We need to have more equity and in access, internet access, device access. Well, the pandemic did some of this and it took some of these old structures, like a physical environment that we depended on, it took it away for a little while. And I think it took it away long enough so that now people are realizing that these, some of these good things Yes, we're all tired, and yes, there was there was some stress and pain and tears involved too, but there are some good things here, and I think that's where school leaders are trying to focus on what can we carry forward, and some of those things I think are the ones that are going to stick. After my conversation with Chris, I was left inspired by the expansiveness of the data that his research team collected and what this data reveal about effective practices for engaging students in online learning. As Chris mentioned, what really shines through when you read the report are some of the specific quotes from virtual teachers on how they've leveraged these strategies to connect with their online students. If you want to check these out for yourself, you can find the full report at michiganvirtual.org research. Though the context for many of the virtual educators surveyed is quite different from the context in which many teachers taught this year during the pandemic, Chris and his team are hopeful that these findings can ignite larger conversations on how we can leverage the expertise of these seasoned virtual instructors to help boost the engagement of online learners everywhere. Next month in June, Chris and some of his colleagues are facilitating a series of workshops called Moving Forward, where they'll be coaching school teams and individual teachers through the process of figuring out what's next and outlining steps to prepare them for a student-centered future. If you appreciated Chris's perspective, consider signing up for one of these workshops at michiganvirtual.org slash moving hyphen forward. As we look to the future, we'll continue to celebrate Michigan educators, sharing their hopes, their fears, their dreams, and their beliefs in what's best for our children as we move forward into a new era of post-pandemic learning. Without a doubt, it's hard work to keep students engaged when you don't interact with them face-to-face -face on a daily basis, especially during this past year when many teachers were thrust into a fully virtual learning environment for the first time. But with leaders like Chris forging our path forward, if there's one thing we're certain of, it's that the future is bright. 
Thank you for joining us for this episode of Bright, stories of hope and innovation in Michigan classrooms. This podcast is produced by Herbie Gaylord, is hosted by me, Nikki Herta, and is made possible by Michigan Virtual, a nonprofit organization that's leading and collaborating to build learning environments for tomorrow. Education is changing faster than ever. Discover new models and resources to move learning forward at your school at michiganvirtual.org.